Uh, my name is Kevin Roxas, and I am the Dean of the Woodring College of Education. Uh, I am just so excited uh, for us to host uh, this talk today. I'm welcoming everybody who's coming in. Uh, it's lovely to see a full house. Um, I won't say too many more things, uh, but do want to say two or three things. Um, that was almost a qualifier. I said I wasn't going to say anything, and then I was going to say two or three things. But um, first, welcome. We are just so excited to have you here. I see a lot of uh, students. I know from the registration, we have a lot of uh, uh, of different folks online as well. And this is just gonna be an incredible hour together. Uh, I also wanna say that our talk today is very much rooted in the work of the Woodring College of Education. Uh, we are committed to thinking about uh, and, 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 and fostering uh, work toward equity and justice in schools. And I know that that means a very vague thing, but it also means some very specific things too around how do we engage in schools? How do we lead for justice? How do we change the ways in which we um, think about hiring people for schools? How do we create a culture that leads to uh, better outcomes for all of our students uh, with attention to the needs of specific students? Um, this is the mission of the college and it's rooted uh, this talk today. So I, I wanna just provide you some structure for that. I also want to say it was so exciting. I want to acknowledge the people um, online and person. I was looking through uh, the spreadsheet. So we get spreadsheets every two or three days of who's going to come. And I think we have about 25 or 30 school districts represented um, online, um, which is amazing and really important uh, for us as a college to reach out to our school districts as one of the leading teacher education preparations in the state to do just that, to be partners with our school districts. So we welcome teachers uh, and administrators there. Um, I think the other thing I want to say, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Velez for uh, the land acknowledgement and the introduction. Um, we also have people in so many different uh, roles and responsibilities. We have a lot of students, um, but we also have uh, 17 people from the Bellingham School District, uh, at least 15 or 20 from Western. We have people who are program directors, HR analysts, directors of master's in teaching, digital learning coaches principals, deputy superintendents, high school principals, and the list goes on. There's probably about 30 different job categories. I share that with you before I'm gonna hand it off for the introduction because my, my, my wish for you is as you walk away from the, our hour together here, roughly an hour here together, is how are you gonna use what you hear today to catalyze your own work in those places? Right? In what ways, if you're an ADI director or um, a professor or a teacher or a, and, and most importantly, a teacher education student, in what ways will our talk this afternoon change the way in which you're thinking about your work or solidify the work you're doing toward justice, right? That would be a great hour spent together uh, to be catalyzed by the incredible words that are going to be shared with Dr. by Dr. Jackson in a few minutes. So let me hand it over to the Associate Dean um, for Academic Affairs, Dr. Velez, who's going to do the land acknowledgement and the introduction. Thank you. So I ran in my <laughs> class, so I'm a little warm. Um, Wonder, hopefully this is working okay online. Hopefully you all can hear me online. Um, so hello everyone. Um, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Veronica Velez. I, most people on campus just know me as Vero. Um, and I prefer to go by Vero. I always say that uh, in my community, if I hear my full name, it's because I'm in trouble for something. And so um, Vero will do just fine. So we wanna open tonight's event by acknowledging that we gather on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish base, Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascades watershed from time immemorial. We express our deepest respect and gratitude for Western Washington's indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and Nooksack tribe for their, their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. We remember that settler colonialism is an ongoing and pervasive ideology and structure, which we must commit to dismantling in our, in our lives, in our classrooms, in our communities and beyond. Now in sharing these words, I want to stress the importance of moving beyond symbolic or empty gestures of solidarity. Chelsea Val, Matisse activist and scholar, underlines this aim when it comes to land acknowledgement. acknowledgement. She states, if we think of territorial acknowledgements as sites of potential disruption, they can be transformative acts that to some extent undo indigenous erasure. 
I believe this is true as long as these acknowledgements discomfort both those speaking and hearing the words. The fact of indigenous presence should, should force non-indigenous peoples to confront their own place on these lands. So thank you. So I have the distinct honor of introducing tonight's speaker, Dr. William Jackson. So I'm gonna do the formal introduction that many of us may have become familiar with. If you're here, you probably read a little bit about this, but I think it's important to state all those accomplishments again. So as a visionary educational school principal, Dr. William Jackson centers his why on the principles of justice, equity, access, and radical love. His commitment to these values is evident in his daily practice, ensuring that both educators and students discover joy and purpose in their educational journey. At Nathan Hill High School, his leadership is centered in equity and justice and guides decision-making around professional development, hiring practices, staffing arrangements, and budgeting, resulting in more equitable outcomes for educators, students, and families. Dr. Jackson is a mentor of principals and shares his experience and knowledge on leadership development, supporting school and community culture and the nuances of change theory. He is an active academic, serving as, in, as an instructor at the University of Washington's Education Department. He teaches the courses, um, this is the title of the course, Shaping Culture and Leading Change in the Danforth Principal Preparation Program and Transformative Teaching and Learning in the Leadership for Learning Superintendent Preparation Program at UW. His exemplary leadership has earned him the 2024 Washington State Secondary Principal of, of the Year Award. So can you ask, please? And he is recognized nationally by the National Association of Secondary School Principals as a nominee for the National Principal of the Year in Washington, D.C. And of course, you can find his influential work online um, and definitely at the University of Washington College of Education website, and of course, the Seattle Times, but in many places you can find more about uh, Dr. Jackson's work. But those of you who know me <laughs> know that being asked to give tonight's introduction meant that I had to gather some important intel. Dr. Kristen French and Director Elaine Mahari are dear colleagues and friends, and they just so happen to have the intel that I needed. You see, they knew Dr. Jackson more than 10 years ago when he was a student at, at WW and worked in SEED, the Center for Education, Equity, and Diversity, which Dr. French directed. Dr. Jackson was part of the football team. Did you all know that we had a football team at Western? <laughs> I just want to kind of uh, note this, that we used to have a football team, and Dr. Jackson was a part of that football team. Um, but he was a part of that team when the team ended. And although the impact of this cut was huge, Dr. Jackson built off the leadership and team building skills he gained as a football player and applied them to his journey toward becoming a transformative educator. So Lane and Kristen described Dr. Jackson as always upbeat, welcoming, friendly, and loving. They shared stories about Dr. Jackson's contributions in SEED and as a youth mentor in a program called Youth For Real at Shuckson Middle School that later became what we know today as the BEATS program. According to them, the students just loved Dr. Jackson. He was encouraging, authentic, and easily captivated a room. He was by far the most popular Youth For Real mentor. They also shared Dr. Jackson's depth of wisdom, how he had such a keenness to read a space. For example, noting how he quickly named the contradictions of campus diversity initiatives the moment his picture was used without his permission to encourage black students and other students of color to apply to a STEM scholarship, the same programs that at the time were engaging in practices that kept out students like him. In fact, his picture showed up in a lot of promotional materials across campus, using his likeness to recruit by failing to retain the most marginalized at WW. And it was this wit combined with his charm, passion for young people, and a clear commitment to justice that made him the clear candidate for a coveted assistantship in SEED. Kristen and Elaine shared with me SEED's evaluation of Dr. Jackson when he applied for this position. And I want to share just a few words from the summary of that evaluation prepared by my sisters. The committee unanimously decided that William Jackson III, based on skills, experiences, and commitment, most closely matched what SEED was looking for in the SEED coordinator. William clearly exceeds the expectations. 
He has a leadership skills along with a documented history of commitments to support college students from marginalized communities, connect with university services, and facilitate dialogue with students, parents, and teachers around multicultural issues that support access to equitable education. He deeply understands the difficulties of students who are first generation, drawing on very pertinent funds of knowledge that make him unique among applicants. He possesses institutional capital that reflects deep relationships with people across campus and is keenly strategic in how to do courageous conversations. He was the only applicant who brought up students, saying, I am passionate to be part of SEED so I can help students. His love for students is unquestionable. He possesses the spirit of reciprocity and can easily see him as a role model for others. He is powerful in his presence and is the best match of what we want to be as SEED. Now, in sharing this from more than a decade ago, it's clear that Dr. Jackson is the real deal. He walks the talk and has for a long time. He has lived his life with purpose, reminding us as teachers that as teachers and educational leaders, we must be willing to ask ourselves time and time again two very simple but important questions. For what and for whom? For what and for whom are we committed to struggling and fighting for? For what and for whom does this educational journey matter? For what and for whom are we willing to do the difficult work of reimagining educational spaces toward radical possibility and transformation? Dr. Jackson embodies the spirit of justice in all he does and has been. Mil gracias for accepting our invitation to be here today. Help me in welcoming this gran maestro, this gran leader, Dr. William Jackson III. Yeah. Wow. I guess we can all go home now, huh? <laughs> um, thank you. That was really kind. Uh, the, I hold that deeply in my heart. You might want a copy of that for the tough days. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm holding that for a second, so thank you. And thank you all for, for having me today. I have so many relatives here in the work, uh, so many future relatives that I see, uh, so many fighters for justice, and uh, so many folks that are here to, to, to be a part of this. So I'm extremely grateful to be here, thank you. Um, Rachel, hold me accountable for time. I, I teach one of the classes. She's actually here as a, as a student. Uh, she teaches, uh, or sorry, excuse me. She's in our Danforth preparation pro principal preparation program, and she's a principal intern out here. So she chose to came, come out here. And in class, I never follow the slides. So I'm struggling with that. Um, I, I, I'm going to try to get there, but there's a, there's a purpose here. So that's why I'm saying, Rachel, hold me accountable to this. All righty. So today, our focus is on leading for justice in schools, uh, how community-based epistemology in black and brown influential presence creates opportunities for all. Uh, before we go into some of the lecture and some of the talk, uh, can we move slides, please? This tech is like beyond me, so. Yes, uh, let's do some uh, community building real quick. So uh, where do you find yourself most welcome? Uh, if if you if you're like me, I I just got here, so I just need to settle in real quick. So I want to be by myself. I'm going to take two minutes alone and reflect. That's fine. Um, some others are really engaging and want to step into conversation. So take two minutes with your shoulder partner, or with you can walk, step up, and take two minutes to just uh, talk about where you find yourself most welcome. <laughs> All right, so I'm just telling a story about uh, my time at Western. Um, can we go to the, the next slide? And so at that time, I was connected through, the first thing was through Office of Admissions. And through the Office of Admissions, I was also connected through a, a program that was being launched called HANDS, Helping Admit New and Diverse Students. And so through that process and through the work that I was doing with Janice and with the other students, uh, we were able to help uh, go into schools and help students and uh, bring in students 
and uh, do that recruiting and retaining effort that I was doing as an athlete. And that really brought a lot of uh, warmth to me. And another thing that I was doing as well was uh, giving presentations about the qualities of coming to Western. And so through that time, I was connected to Dr. French. Uh, and that's where Dr. French asked if I was interested in becoming a teacher. And I didn't think about that, but I was a social studies uh, major at the time. And I loved Bellingham and loved Western and was also considering what my future was at that time. And um, that's where we got connected as well. So through that, this is where connections are super important. There's a, there's a through line here. Uh, through that time, uh, next slide, I'm sorry. I have to move a little bit. Um, through that time, I was then connected to um, uh, Bruce Larson right here. And so that's where I was connected to him. And here's an interesting story that I shared in the lunch. So I'm not the most, uh, the best test taker. And one of the entry points and barriers to entry for students a lot of times is an exam. And one is the GRE. And so I had this meeting that Dr. French introduced me to, uh, to Bruce Larson. And I was like, oh, man. And, and he, uh, I shared with him that I'm super passionate about education and I want to help students. But I think that this might be a challenge because I have to take this test. And this is going to mess up the whole Woodring admissions process when I tell the story, so I'm very sorry. Um, however, he said, your passion is more important than this test, so don't worry about the test. And so this is when I was tied in with Hans. I was tied in with Dr. French. I was already tied in with uh, Bruce Larson. And then we started to, I started to learn so many ways of being. There wasn't any academic ties to that yet. Uh, not much, uh, not, there wasn't the um, community-based epistemology as a term to me. That was just love. It was just care. It was just people caring and stepping out to support. And that's what I learned in my first entry to becoming an educator. And so in my time at um, Seed, we had some, uh, I had some funny stories and some really fun stories to that, uh, that, that, I, that I had, but um, I'll share one of the most passionate ones was that uh, I was able to, during uh, one of the projects that we had was uh, um, explore something that is a, a, a deep issue in education. And at the time, during the, edu during the early 2010s, it was around testing and I was, that was a big issue, right? And so I was hyper-focused on inequities in the system. And I was a history, social studies major. So I was trying to burn the whole system down. And I was like, this system's super racist. And let's like figure out, I didn't even want to figure it out. I just wanted to tear it down. And so the first step in tearing it down was to examine the inequities in our school system. And so I was able to present that and see it as well. And that was able to build up my, my sense of self. But through that truly was the people that were there. I was able to do a lot of work with Elaine as well and do a lot of work with others that are in this space, Linda, people that are here. And that is where my basis comes from as a, as a teacher. So plug, uh, the College of Education is a strong College of Education. Um, I was able to see some good work today as well um, around equity and justice. I'm always gonna push for more of that focus. And it, it needs it even more right now, given the time that we're in, given the political climate that exists surrounding us. And the, 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 there's a lot of uh, concern and fear about going into teaching. Um, but truly, you saw the first picture. That's what it's about. It's not about these people outside uh, banging down the doors and saying you can't teach about black students. That's craziness, right? It's about loving your kids. Anyways, that's a side. Um, so I graduated and moved on. And then uh, I, I do want to take a, another pause because this moves into another story. But I want to share. This is going to then move us. I'm transitioning us a little bit. This time and everything and all of that. I know time is relative, but we are limited with time. Um, so community-based epistemology and Black and brown people's influential presence. And what I was able to get through the love and care that was brought to me here. All right. So let's move slides, please. 
So reflect for a moment. I'll give one minute for this. Not a talk because, you know, time. So how has your journey in education or your journey, if you're not in education, shaped you? I gave a little bit about my journey of education, but how has your journey shaped you? Give yourself about a minute to reflect on that. Okay. Hold that and think about that as we move forward. Um, in a different time, I hope to come back at a different time, I would ask that we actually talk and unpack that, the time. All right, so um, when I first got to Nathan Hill as an assistant principal, prior to that, I had four years as a, as a teacher. I was able to teach uh, social studies, teach uh, world history. I taught ethnic studies. I taught um, even, uh, I was an advisor for our Black Student Union. And then I came to Nathan Hill as an assistant principal. And any aspiring principals or aspiring assistant principals, one of the roles that you have early on is the toughest part because the love part of the job gets kind of twisted a little bit. And that's discipline. And I had to figure out how I could remix that. I was struggling with so many black and brown students being referred to me on a day-to-day -day basis. I was struggling with that instructionally um, on the teacher side, and I was struggling with that personally and as a black educator. Um, and I was pulling through and un having to unpack that myself. So what I, over time, I was able to see trends, meet families, connect with students. Um, I would connect with them every day, every other day. They're coming to my office and I'm spending a lot of time with them, calling families, bringing in families, learning about their story, learning about their siblings, learning about everything that's happening in their lives, learning about their epistemologies and how they are taught, how they're raised, how they think. And then they're giving me feedback about what's happening from their end in the classroom. And so over time, after that first year, I had about 25 students, about 20, 25 students, black males. And I decided to make a mentorship with all of them. And the really interesting piece was some of them had conflicts with each other. So that was just a whole, whole fun, restorative uh, uh, tension that we had to work through. But we would even have celebrations when they came, returned from school and all sorts of things that we would do. But the purpose was for the identity development, empowerment, and to push the system. Because what I was learning from them was that our, not only was I seeing the inequities of the system, and struggling with what I had addressed, with what I had studied, but also I was seeing it at first hand um, as I was working with teachers, as I was working with admin, seeing the data, the trends nationally, and then experiencing it with students, why they were being pushed out of class, why they weren't being invited in, why teachers weren't responding to them, why they weren't being responded to culturally. And so I struggled with that. But then I said, you know, I have this immense power as an assistant principal because now I can create space, shift locations, shift resources. And so I used that power to create a space for them. Where then what we were able to do and accomplish was these, these three individuals, they started out, as many would see as a pipeline, they would not have graduated had some of these opportunities not been opened to their, uh, to their visibility. And so eventually, uh, all three of them were on our Black Student Union. They joined our Associated Student Body. We didn't just throw them in there. We built strategies through the mentorship time. They ran campaigns for how to actually be a part of the Associated Student Body. They gave speeches, gave talks, shifted our staff culture, um, asked and made demands. We actually, Instead of just going and saying, What's, why is the principal not doing this? I'd say, hey, what we need to do is write out demands. And this is the document that you use for writing demands. Hey, we need to use this space for this. I have this power. So here's the building permit that you can actually write. And so they can create space without our authority. So they're learning how to create space and navigate systems. And then they're teaching their peers how to create space and navigate systems. And then they're pushing us to shift our hiring practices and our staffing arrangements. Next slide, please. So this was, uh, this is where it, 
where we speak about community-based epistemology. And our students, essentially, what that can be translated to is teaching and building relationships and bonds based off of how uh, uh, students or peers, and let's use students for this example, are uh, brought up in their community. And that's an example of that. And so the way that they were brought up and the way that my students were brought up, how am I teaching them and how are teachers responding and teaching them in their classrooms based off of how they're being raised, opposed to teaching them to change who they are and, and switch who they are and transform their identity to fit into an environment. How do we transform um, to make an environment warm and welcome for them so then they have the access to push us? And so that's what this, this right here was a forum uh, years ago where our students actually made demands about hiring practices, demands about staffing, demands about um, how we uh, actually do have our curriculum. And so through this, we're able to create more equitable grading practices, um, uh, move into uh, what we have college in the high school. So that's available, uh, accessible for all students, ethnic studies for all students. Um, they have to take it. It's in their uh, course. Uh, it's uh, U.S. history. Uh, you can have that or ethnic studies, but we don't offer U.S. history. We only offer ethnic studies. Um, and uh, just different things like that and offering students to be trained on, on hiring, uh, making sure hiring practices, all of our staff are trained and these students will be in interviews. And so they have just as much feedback that to offer to staff. They have building, they have a vote for building leadership team. So they are there, they have a seat at the table and they sometimes bring the table with them. So, um, and they'll hold us accountable to that. So these are things that were done through time. And um, could somebody read that quote? Is that visible for everybody? Go ahead. Thank you. So that's a text that uh, we use in uh, in our in our class. There's two: "Stuck Improving uh, Racial Equity in School Leadership" by Dakota Irby, and uh, "Culturally Responsive School Leadership" by Muhammad Khalifa. And a community-based epistemology is situated in that. And that quote speaks to the power that we have, even as a teacher, even as an administrator. Uh, whatever level you're at in education, you have immense levels of power to actually help. Uh, build community or break community. And so that is that speaks to what we were able to grow um, at Nathan Hill. Next slide, please. I think the next step was uh, the black and brown people's influential presence. And that's what Dakota Irby speaks of in Stuck and Proven Racial Equity and School Leadership. This is my administrative team, uh, Ms. Stewart Monroe and Ms. Proctor. Both of them have come in and uh, co-taught with me in our Danforth classes uh, about budget and hiring and staffing practices. And so I think that that piece is the, the, the final lever, and there's many more, but the, the next lever of where our students pushed us at is how are we seen visibly and how are we supported visibly as well? And what strategies are you using to actually bring in more educators of color? How are you making it safe for um, your team to be uh, women leaders of color as well? What spaces are you creating? So when do I step back and ensure that they have space to lead um, where our staff might just look to me as a man, right? Or are, are anybody who steps in the building so my goal is to flatten that hierarchy as well. And if you've seen us teach as well, um, as a group, um, our, our focus is to, uh, we call ourselves a triangle and not, not really a hierarchical system. And that's what we want to embody so our students see that as well. Our students see uh, co-teaching happen. The, our educators see it through our process of leadership and our system, our system continues to reverberate. 
that way. So I'll read this quote. It's a long one. Black and brown people possess a distinct knowledge that stems from experiences of white supremacy and racism, as well as the generational resilience that stems from the effort to live to live as free as possible from racial subjugation. Black and brown people's influential presence is evidenced when black and brown people's multiple experiential knowledge, priorities, and ways of being reshape power structures in the school organization. So when students not only see us and see that we look like them, but see that we operate like them and talk like them and can help them as well, um, they feel safer and more welcome in our, in our school environments. So that goes into the hiring, recruiting, and retaining educators of color too. And so uh, I know we are limited with time and I'm coming to a close because, and I do wanna open up with questions because there's plenty that I have data and all that weird stuff that's fun and I could bring that in any talk that's happening after. But I do wanna open up for any questions or thoughts uh, before we, uh, we're at 450 right now and, and, and we're juggling with time. So, oh, I got a hand, a thumbs up. Are any thoughts that have come to your mind or any uh, uh, questions or responses? Yes, go ahead. Hey, Barry, like, curriculum and looking at the concerns of education system. How do you continue moving forward when it always seems like the system is always an issue? As like a future teacher, especially in the lower education levels, I've done a lot of things I want to do, but also understanding my role as a first year teacher and wanting that change is also a hierarchy as well. So what would you advise to help me continue moving forward with like community-based eschatology of that? Mm -hmm. Well, you need things for people in mind because people are not, they might not have heard that much. Sure. Um, can I uh, summarize it the yes. best way I heard it? Yes. Uh, for those that didn't hear it, uh, in summary, um, how do I carry forward uh, with uh, consistent racist structures that make it extremely challenging and uh, demoralizing to move forward? Is that okay? Uh, I would say, and I had an opportunity to step into a class today, um, and a, a question was asked similar in that way. And I think that what's most important is to strategy, anybody who's emerging and going into interviews soon, center your values when you first uh, step into an interview. It's very, if you, if you, if I have an interview for a job, I'm going to say that I believe and I, in, I, I believe in equity, ju justice, access, and lead with radical love. That interview committee is going to decide in that moment that I'm not fit for the job if I'm not uh, that type of person, or if, if I'm not fit for their type of environment, right? So my, I know many are looking for employment, so that's one step, but please lead with your values so then uh, you know that you're stepping into a space that is encouraging. As this next step, if you lead with your values, then you can come back as a conversational piece as well. When we had our interview, I expressed that these were my values. And I not only did I express this, this is the strategies that I'm hoping to bring in to the classroom. How can you support me with this? And um, they brought you in. So they're, they have to support you with that. And if they don't, then they need to be held accountable for that. Easy for me to say in this space, but I, uh, I, I think that that's very important. And so please hold to your values. I, I encourage that as well. Justin, I have a related question that yeah. came in online. Yeah. For me to ask. If you, if you you could maybe read this here so the folks yep. online could hear this uh, this one here. Do you have any advice for strategies or approaches to creating impactful change in school environments where the majority of staff and faculty have not come to terms with the ways they perpetuate injustice? How do we change systems when we are a small few who see the urgency to do so? Okay, um, one thing that I, as a black educator, there is a capacity that my that I have for uh, the the tension that exists around racial equity work. So there's two pieces to this that I find is important to school change and uh, uh, community growth. And this is through change theory. Um, I believe that there is an adaptive approach, and there's a technical approach. 
An adaptive approach is in my, how I see it is changing hearts and minds, doing work around culturally responsive teaching, white supremacy culture and its impacts on students, um, focusing on culturally responsive uh, uh, school environments, culturally responsive teaching, epistemologies, and learning about personal racism and bias and how that impacts students. And then there's the technical changes. That's the operational changes. That's the side of actually hiring and staffing, scheduling. As a teacher, how do you create your curriculum? How do you grade students? Is it a lottery? Is it a uh, you know, lucky student number five? Or is it through equitable grading practices aligned with your colleagues so that a student doesn't have a lottery for which teacher they get for a particular subject? Um, so those are more of the technical things that are that don't require as much of this side. And it depends on the space that I'm in and which side I lead on. Um, this time right now in the year, it's February. So we're like stuck in the middle of it, right? This is like the real work time. This is the justice center work on the adaptive side. We're doing racial equity work, culturally responsive work, but it's also budget time. So we're focused on the technical side as well. And so it's a day by day shift on where my heart or mind is at in that moment. But in all honesty, uh, they both need to work together. But as a teacher, when you're stepping into that, whoever uh, raised that question, I think that you do have power to focus on the technical side when the adaptive side isn't working. Um, what made you decide to become a principal and would you uh, recommend for any person who wants to be a principal to be a teacher first? And I ask that ignorantly because I don't know if that is um, a prerequisite to being a teacher. Sure. I think, uh, so one, teaching is really fun. That's, yeah. so that's, that's just, that. In, in honesty, I, I love teaching. That's why I'm back at UW teaching. I love teaching. So, it, and to be a principal, I think that that level of influence is necessary. To have been in the, to understand what teachers are struggling with and working through and to actually make that adaptive change to, if I'm teach, if, if you two are teachers teaching social studies and I'm saying, hey, we need to align our grade books. We're only focused on the front side of the curriculum. If I've never taught, that doesn't land correctly, you know? But if I've taught, I can say, I know what it's like working with these colleagues. It's tough, but we got to work together. How can we do that? But let's move from the content side of it because that's the fun work. Let's move to the grade side. And how do we align that together? So I think as an example, that that is, it's not everybody's route, but I think it's important because it carries a little bit more influence to moving the, the harder work that's instructional on the instructional side. Yeah. Um, I come from Seattle, and I'm curious about like where you're at a school. Ooh. Yeah, but I come from Roosevelt. Okay. Um, so I'm actually curious. Hey, Tammy. How being a teacher at Hale, where you guys are like progressing to work on these issues, what it, what it is like knowing that Roosevelt is just the neighborhood over and that and what goes on in that school and all the chaos there. Um, every school has, uh, this is, if we weren't online, I have to say something different because <laughs> I don't know what I did, but, um, every school has its challenges. Nathan L does too. Um, and my school is imperfect. There's, there's uh, resistance to some of the work as well. Um, and I would say that, uh, I know Roosevelt has uh, a particular, uh, identity there, but there's students that want to go to Roosevelt because of the same reasons why I'm standing here today. You know, so that level of uh, it's 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 a uh, but to your question, um, how do you still push forward? Uh, I, I offered that that suggestion as well. I do know the work that uh, Seattle Public Schools is focused on and that you have an anchor uh, to push with the strategic plan and the the policies. Not every school district has that power uh, with policies like policy 0030, which is an, a racial equity policy. Uh, 10010, which is an inclusion policy. So effectively, contractually, racist practice has to be pushed out. Um, and you can hold that accountable. 
beneath, above, however you see it, parallel to, to you. Um, that might not help your personal safety in that environment pushing that, but it does help you be able to do the work, so. That's another related question yeah. came in online. If you don't mind reading this, so the folks can uh, can hear. Which one? Uh, this one. Here. If you can read my hand. In. How do I get my district to be motivated to recruit teachers and leaders of color when they think they're already doing enough? Students. <laughs> Students. Um, one thing that I I was in a building leadership team meeting yesterday, and uh, I shared as a strategy, and I always. This strategy is extremely important. When all else fails, center students in the work. If there is a racial equity agenda that you want and students are calling for it, but your leadership team is resistant to it, center students in the work. It's hard as a principal. It's hard as a superintendent. It's hard as a board, uh, a cabinet to resist student pressure. Um, because it's hard to look in front of students and say, we are not going to do this work. Um, it's, it, that's, that's my recommendation is always to hear their voice and then their strategies to centering student voice as well. There's one, some students are very fired up and want to get in front of people. Some students want to be away from that because that can bring violence as well. So bring data in other ways. Um, some want to be recorded. Um, some want to uh, partner with other schools build movements, coalitions. So there's many ways to center students where we're not in the center of that as leaders or the center of that as teachers, um, where you can make radical change in your school through student voice. Yeah, there was a question, sorry. Yep, we got our people of color. <laughs> so how would you avoid like not being organized? Yeah, uh, well, that's a legitimate uh, challenge, uh, a legitimate concern as well. Um, I would offer uh, that there's a lot of power there. And so I, and there's a lot of challenges that we go through as a admin team. That's amazing that it was a whole admin team of color, but there's, it's challenging when you have a whole white staff that and you're trying to do some of that work, but that's where you do have some power to make some changes with the hiring. Um, we do with, uh, depends on the support of your school board and district, but we do have immense power with hiring teams and to ensure that it's balanced, that we have students on there, that we hire the right people to help change and move things. And sometimes you ride out technical change and people leave. They don't want to be there. That's possible. And then you are able to hire in people that do. Um, and that's, uh, that's a hard side of it. But it's a but it, that's the other side of it too. That's on a leadership side, but as as a teacher, that's hard to sit through, and I understand. Uh, this is this might be really niche, but I wanted to gauge your experience. Uh, my dad is in a school board like higher ability, fire ability position, and one of the one of the things that he wrestles with as an admin of color is how do you bring teachers of color into a district with predominantly white students where they may not feel like their identity as a teacher is recognized by the people that they're teaching. And what do you say to teachers who come into an interview or an application or a recruitment process with that kind of concern? That's not a niche question. That's, um, how do you, I'll, I'll repeat the best way I can. How do you recruit and retain teachers of color when it's predominantly white students? Um, my, I was speaking with a group earlier today, and my question is always what work is centered um, in the, what, what, what is the focus of the work? Is there a focus, uh, what texts are being read? Um, what agendas are being focused on? Um, if you go on, I mean, I know I'm Ruru with Seattle Public Schools, but if you go on our website, you see our strategic plan goals, black, male student achievement. We start there and we move up from there. So even if it's a white school, we're focused on black male student achievement. If there's no black male students there, we're still focused on black male student achievement and the strategies to address black male student achievement. So the practices in the text that we're reading and the tools that we're bringing in should address those, 
which means that effectively there should be a space that's safe for educators of color to be in those spaces. How is that held accountable? That should be held accountable through leadership. That should be held accountable through school boards. That should be held accountable by creating those affinity spaces, hearing feedback loops, taking inquiry cycles to ensure that they're hearing where it's unsafe, what's the problems, what's the challenges with families maybe, and how can we address that as a school board and a school district and a leadership team so you're not in the center of this as a black teacher or a teacher of color. Okay. I hope that helped. I hope you can answer this as honestly as possible, but as somebody who's open by talking about your struggles with test taking, um, what is your opinions as, a, as an administrator on the traditional grading system of like A through F and where do you see any opportunities to maybe shift that towards a, a more, I don't know, holistic is the right word, but just a, a, a different learning environment or, or um, grading system, I guess. Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, how do we, or what is my beliefs on shifting grading systems, uh, right? Essentially, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say that that is a long adaptive change that needs to happen over time. Uh, my beliefs are that student identity is tied to their grades. And particularly, student identity is tied to their math grade starting in third grade. So the moment that they get into math in third grade and they start to see they can be an amazing writer, but if they don't perform well in math, their identity and sense of belonging in school starts to diminish from that moment on, that moment upward. So I hope that answers how I feel about it. Um, but I also understand that that takes a long time and that starts in pre-K teaching how we do a whole different level of standards and a whole different level of uh, grading and it has to take a holistic change because the, the moment that uh, even grades, you can do standard, some of them are, I feel more equitable, but each of them still have the opportunity to grub for grades, the opportunity for identity in grades the opportunity for uh, competition within grades and the loose metrics that teachers can sometimes, we can sometimes uh, push a few students out. They didn't show up to class five of the times. This student showed up every time. Um, so maybe they deserve this grade and this person deserves that grade, right? That happens. Um, and so I, I do believe that there does need to be a different metric, but that would take a long time and a long belief system because uh, our country operates on that. That's a that's how it operates and through a capitalist country. Take it, I, I hate to get political here, but there, there is a grade system that's tied to performance, that's tied to how you uh, move in society. That's not for this seminar though. That is, <laughs> that's for another one. Um, so I know there's, uh, if, if you can stay and remain, but I know that there's a close happening. If you, wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, mind taking the mic just for a moment, yeah. I will say for the folks with your hands up, you will have a chance to ask those questions. Yeah. Thank you. Just so the folks online can hear me, I want to uh, thank you for the time for being here today. Um, I apologize to the folks online and to you for the technical difficulties because I know that through that that that, that throws a that, that throws a fumble on the floor, and you you you're well equipped to scoop down and, and pick that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I really want to appreciate it. There are a few things, a few folks I want to appreciate here momentarily. I also want to say there's a, a reception out in the hallway right after after this closing. There's some um, light refreshments. And then uh, students and others will be invited back in to hang out uh, for a while. And you can have a chance to uh, to ask some of those questions that that we didn't have a chance to uh, to pick up here moment uh, a moment ago. Um, but real briefly, a couple um Couple folks, I'd like to uh, to appreciate. Um, you know, the event wouldn't have been possible without the work and support of uh, Western's Advancement Office and Alumni Engagement Team, and that includes Kim O'Neill and Janine Bangstrom, who is online. I know trying to 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 problem solve with us. Additionally, Elizabeth Serrano was extremely helpful from the dean's office in uh, in organizational uh, elements, um, as is. Uh, 
Eileen with communications. Eileen was here a moment ago and she uh, came to the rescue and we had a little tech uh, tech problem. And I also want to uh, thank our Dean, Kevin Roxas. Uh, Kevin, you know, your commitment um, to pull this together and your walking the talk and showing and modeling to Woodring and in Woodring's community, to our alumni, to our partners about educating for justice is um, inspiring as well. I want to thank you as, as well as the uh, uh, Associate Dean uh, uh, Beres, um, Beres, <laughs> Vero Velez um, and Dr. Jackson. Lastly, for you, I want to really uh, appreciate your time, uh, appreciate what you are doing in the communities, what you're doing for us still as an alumni, the way that you're wearing your truth and, 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 and supporting us. Uh, I want to thank you, and Weston thanks you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, appreciation. You know, can't get out of here without money. <laughs> exactly. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, I got you. Thank you very much. So.